In this lecture, we begin examining the works of the Danish philosopher and theologian Kierkegaard. In this regard, we move in an opposite direction, or at least a different direction, than that of Karl Marx, whose emphasis was primarily on the transformation of human society. Kierkegaard, however, introduces a new phase in the critique of German idealism. That is the emphasis on the role of the individual and the self and the importance of the personal development of every one of us. Thus, Kierkegaard is oftentimes looked upon as the prototype of 20th century existentialism. He certainly anticipated what came to fruition and influenced what came to fruition later in the 20th century in the various forms of existentialism, uh, including Jean-Paul Sartre, Camus, Gabriel Marcel, and others. Yet at the same time, Kierkegaard also influenced philosophers of the 20th century who have a broader vision than that of existentialism, although they intersect with existentialism, particularly Martin Heidegger. We cannot also overlook the many theologians that have at least some connection to Kierkegaard's thinking, whether Paul Tillich, whether Rudolf Boltmann, whether Karl Barth, just to name a few. And that shows you how extensive Kierkegaard's influence is. In this lecture, we will concentrate really on two aspects of Kierkegaard's thinking. First, how he comes out of the Hegelian tradition as did Karl Marx, but in developing a critique of Hegel moves in a direction contrary to Marx. Second, we'll address Kierkegaard's critique of Christianity. And in this regard, we're going to see as we move toward the completion of the course that Kierkegaard really gets paired with a later 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who also pioneered a critique of Christianity and was also critical of the system building of Hegel. Ironically, we'll see how Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, the latter proclaiming the death of God, the former trying to reinvent Christianity, different in so many respects, but overlapping in so many respects as well. And we'll concentrate on those relationships and connections in the concluding lectures of the course. So with that introduction in mind, let us briefly look at Kierkegaard, the individual, and get some flavor of his personal biography. Here's a picture of Kierkegaard with his dates, and we can see that he didn't really live a particularly long time. Nevertheless, he was one of the most prolific writers of that period, and also pioneered a strategy that would become very famous, that is, writing under a pseudonym. And this, as it were, ironical approach to developing and implementing his theological and philosophical viewpoints. Let me add that Kierkegaard also was somewhat of a colorful figure. Most famous in this regard was his romance with the beautiful Danish woman Regina Olsen, whom Kierkegaard was very much in love and at one point wanted to marry. But when the romance broke apart, he later dedicated himself to philosophy and theology. It is 
somewhat reminiscent of this that the question arises, did he himself believe that his love for this woman could not be achieved with the development of his philosophical and theological passion, that is, simultaneously. Be that as it may, Kierkegaard later regretted the breaking off of that romance and wrote considerably uh, and passionately and with great lucidity about marriage and the importance of marriage as an ethical commitment. So with this background, let us jump into literally the key insights that shape Kierkegaard's philosophy and theology. Kierkegaard, like Marx, has many quotable quotes. Here is one taken from the concept of dread or anxiety. Kierkegaard states, in making this division, attention is at once drawn to the fact that in a certain sense the future signifies more than the present and the past. For the future is in a sense the whole of which the past is a part, and in a sense the future may signify the whole. This is due to the fact that the future means first of all the future or the future is the incognito in which the future as incommensurable for time would nevertheless maintain its relation to time. Thus sometimes we speak of the future as identical with eternity. The future life equals eternal life. Now when I read that quote I think it may have come across a little bit misleading. But what Kierkegaard is trying to say is that the future is in a certain sense understood as the combination of the present and the past contained in this whole. And thus by the future we just don't mean one segment of time versus the other segments of time. We mean the inclusion of time as a whole. And thereby when we talk about the inclusion of time as a whole or its unity that pervades that wholeness we are no longer talking about time in simply a linear sense of before and after. Thus, understood in this way, what Kierkegaard is saying then is, the future equals eternal life. That is, the future equals eternity. This is basically his way of understanding the principle of Christianity of salvation, in which salvation as supposedly a occurrence or an impending future is also the realization of the future as the unity and wholeness of time and thus in salvation the individual in realizing this wholeness and unity at time achieves eternity or eternal life and we'll see further as we develop our lectures on Kierkegaard, how he plays on this notion of time and the relationship between eternity and time as a whole. Let us then proceed further and delve into the intricacies of Kierkegaard's account of philosophy and theology. Let us briefly examine Kierkegaard's opposition to Hegel. Many philosophy of history texts view Kierkegaard as a proto-existentialist. This is accurate, but the turn to the focus on the individual, on existence, proceeds through a critique of Hegel. In this regard, two issues stand out immediately. First, Kierkegaard overturns Hegel's emphasis on the universality of reason in favor of the individual's act of existing. Thus, it is in the critique of Hegel's appeal to the universality of reason that we see Kierkegaard beginning to develop his emphasis on individuality and ultimately on the self. Second, Kierkegaard rejects the idea of a system, for no construct of thought or packaging of truth can speak to the conflicts and struggles of individual existence. And thus, in these two basic 
points, we begin to see the development of the turn to existence that epitomizes Kierkegaard's thought and brings him into the forefront in the conversation as to the beginning of existentialism. Let us look briefly at the idea of the anti-system. Kierkegaard's view and critique of Hegel comes to light in the title of his lengthy book, Concluding Unscientific Postscript. Hegel had advanced the system, the science of the absolute, science in the sense of Wissenschaft. But in a way, Kierkegaard is the unscience. Kierkegaard claims, on the other hand, that the individual stands outside the system, or conversely, that the system can never include the individual. That is, for Kierkegaard, the quanders of life are unsystematic and can only be resolved through the decision exercise in life, that is, in the act of existing itself, and, of course, the emphasis on the individual, the self, making decisions the prioritizing on the act of existing is what brings Kierkegaard to the forefront as a leading proponent of existentialism. Let us look briefly at the shift in focus in Kierkegaard's writings, which come to light in the emphasis on the priority of ethics. Kierkegaard emphasizes, however, ethics, but not in a systematic sense of a collection of rules or even the categorical imperative in Kant's sense. For Kierkegaard, ethics is about something different. Indeed, ethics is about the individual confronting a moral dilemma and seeking to develop choices. However, in the process, the individual risks his or her existence in following through on a choice, that is, in making a commitment and renewing it. Let's take an example. For Kierkegaard, of course, marriage would be an example of such a risk and the willingness to renew a commitment. We all know that Kierkegaard himself had that rather unfortunate dilemma about marriage himself and his own personal life to the beautiful woman Regina Olson. And Kierkegaard's trepidation in this matter thereby translates into the questioning that he himself develops about the premium placed on commitment, and not only on commitment, but the renewal of commitment. And it is in this renewal of commitment that we see the ethical basis of all choosing, according to Kierkegaard. Let us look at one of the most famous statements that comes out of Kierkegaard's philosophy, the claim that truth is subjectivity. And this also was one of the most notable and perhaps easily misunderstood statements in the concluding unscientific postscript. Truth is subjectivity, and subjectivity is the truth. What does Kierkegaard mean by this? The individual discovers the truth, the risk-taking of choice, commitment, and action. That is, through these actions, the truth unfolds in the very act of choosing and in the renewal of that choice through the commitment. But does this simply mean that truth is relative? No, not according to Kierkegaard. Rather, the individual stands under a greater burden that his or her life must now stand for something. And thereby, under this greater burden, the subjectivity of the truth brings to the foreground the weight and emphasis that the self 
must endure in each and every cha- choice, each and every choice throughout the act of existing. And in this way, every choice for Kierkegaard is a referendum, if you will, on the truth, a referendum for what the individual stands for in and through his or her own existence. Unlike Kant, Kierkegaard emphasizes the effective side of life, particularly the emphasis on moods, emotions, and of these, the foremost are specifically despair and dread or anxiety. In this sense, Kierkegaard reveals his influence by his mentor, Shelley, who also emphasizes the priority of dread or anxiety. What for Schelling is called the life dread or life anxiety. But Kierkegaard also emphasizes the negative aspect of despair. Despair is the most pervasive and ubiquitous of all human emotions or affects. Because despair indicates the individual being trapped and caught in indecision and thereby becoming a victim, as it were, of the inability to make decisions, to make commitments, to make uh, and carry out actions, the inability to really wrestle with the meaning of life itself. And it's precisely in this indifference almost and inability or unwillingness to wrestle with the question of the meaning of life that the individual for Kierkegaard falls into despair. And thus, we see Kierkegaard providing an interesting outline of despair in such works as The Sickness Unto Death. Let me emphasize as well briefly as we proceed that one example of despair or instance of despair for Kierkegaard is being mired and absorbed in the diversions of life, in pleasure seeking, in hedonism, and even to a certain extent in apathy and boredom. All of those for Kierkegaard would be examples or symptoms of despair. What then is despair, according to Kierkegaard? As indicated in his, the title of his book, despair is indeed the sickness unto death, in the sense that we are already vulnerable to despair. Almost as if we are born into despair, and that condition extends throughout the entirety of life, or at least potentially can extend throughout the entirety of life, and thereby define an an individual's entire existence. But what is despair? Here we see Kierkegaard reintroducing an aspect or a facet of Hegelian dialectic. Kierkegaard answers this question of despair. It is the willing to be oneself and not to be oneself. That is, it is the selfish striving to be oneself, however, understood in a narcissistic way, or likewise the indifference of not caring to be oneself. And thus, however we cash it, despair emerges as a selfish preoccupation that one is involved in. And the more selfish that preoccupation becomes, even in apathy, even in indifference, the more one is in despair. 
But here is the catch. The worst kind of despair is not even being aware that one is in despair. Let me mention as a literary footnote, the great southern New Orleans writer who lived on the North Shore for a long time in what was called, or what is still called, Covington, Walker Percy, in his epic novel, The Movie Goer, quotes in the epigraph to the novel a line from Kierkegaard's Sickness Unto Death, of course, the line already quoted, the despair is both the willing to be oneself and not willing to be oneself. And Percy's novel thereby goes into the depth of both the diversion and apathy that defines the individual's immersion in despair. So it might be interesting if anyone wants a literary example of Kierkegaard's account of despair to check out the novel, The Moviegoer. Obviously, Kierkegaard's account of despair and subsequently anxiety or dread has had tremendous influence on both literary and philosophical circles. I've already mentioned the influence that Kierkegaard had on the 20th century writer Walker Percy. But we can't ignore the account of anxiety that Kierkegaard developed filtered through Schelling that's probably had a greater influence, particularly in 20th century continental philosophy. In Being in Time, Martin Heidegger emphasizes anxiety as the key fundamental attunement or mood or disposition by which the self experiences the certainty of its to be, the uncertainty of its to be, the unsettling sense that the, that the to be of existence is always counterposed and projected against the backdrop of the possibility of no longer being, that is, the possibility of absolute nothingness or death. And this counterposing and projecting against the backdrop of this, as Heidegger calls it, the dark night of nothing, induces this tremendous unsettling feeling of anxiety or dread. For Heidegger, dread and anxiety, however, are not negative characterizations. They are really our inroad to the basic questioning of the meaning of human existence and thereby the inroad into the philosophical questioning of the meaning of being itself. And thus in Heidegger and in other 20th century thinkers who do bring existentialism to the forefront, we see the indelible and un- disputable influence that Kierkegaard has had. As I've already mentioned, the term angst or angst is fundamental to Kierkegaard's philosophy. Schelling had earlier referred to the life dread, the Lebensangst, or life anxiety that sustains the heroic character of the creator or artist in seeking to bridge the separation between nature and spirit. The great creator has to enter into the breach or into the gulf to achieve the inspiration of creativity and thereby experiences the greatest life dread or life anxiety. For Kierkegaard as well, following Shell, Dread or anxiety is a positive force that allows the individual to confront the uncertainty of choice or freedom, and also is a positive force in the sense that it will provide a catalyst, if you will, to draw the individual out of his or her immersion into the apathy 
of despair. So thus, while Kierkegaard couples despair and dread, he sees dread as more basic than despair as the precondition for leading an individual out of despair. As Kierkegaard discusses in his famous book, The Concept of Dread or The Concept of Anxiety, anxiety is a stepping stone or transition from despair. Anxiety or dread is the unsettling moment and sense of uncertainty, which redirects the individual from the flux of diversions, that is despair, to an awareness of his or her capacity to choose, i.e. one's own freedom. But how do we experience this freedom? For Kierkegaard, we have such an experience by awakening to the sphere of possibilities. Thus, as Kierkegaard states in the concept of anxiety, the greatest education occurs in the school of possibility. And I think this is a beautiful phrase to describe this new kind of education that is predicated on the experience of anxiety or dread, that is the schooling in the wider school of, of life and existence itself, the wider school of possibility. Now we arrive at the beginning of the religious dimension of Kierkegaard's writings, although he's really trying to develop that religious aspect through the discussion of despair and dread or anxiety. And thus we come to the question of faith. For Kierkegaard, the subjective side of human experience and of human existence, as expressed, for example, in these emotions of despair and more positively dread or anxiety, comes to light in the opposition between faith on the one hand and reason on the other. For Kierkegaard, the subjective dimension of faith exceeds reason. The individually based character of faith supersedes reason. Once again, recalling Kierkegaard's famous motto or dictum that truth is subjectivity. Indeed, there is a truth that reason cannot grasp and only faith can reveal. That is the truth pertaining to Christianity and to the manner in which the Savior appeared in human form. The truth appears to be contrary to reason and thereby the truth is not accessible to reason and its dependence upon the basic principle of the law of contradiction. Thus, reason must be suspended, as it were, in order that the individual in the act of existing can undertake a leap, that is, a leap of faith. And faith is thereby predicated, according to Kierkegaard, on the execution and undertaking of this decisive moment, that is, a leap. And why is this leap necessary, as I mentioned. Faith appeals to a truth that supersedes reason and defies reason's emphasis on the law of non-contradiction. And what is the truth that Kierkegaard is talking about that defies reason? It is what Kierkegaard calls the absolute paradox. And here is Hegel's absolute reappearing in a completely antithetical form. The absolute not as comprehensible through reason, but the absolute is precisely incomprehensible through reason. And thereby the absolute appearing in the form of a paradox that is accessible only through faith, through the leap of faith and not through reason. And 
the comparison to Hegel, or I should say the contrast to Hegel, is very important in this context and shows once again that even though Kierkegaard is diverging from Hegel, absolute idealism of Hegel provides the backdrop for understanding the novelty of Kierkegaard's insights. What is the absolute paradox according to Kierkegaard? Well, this is a good question. A paradox is what seems to be a contradiction, but nevertheless has a certain meaning beyond merely being contradictory. And for Kierkegaard, a paradox emerges, an an apparent contradiction in the religious truth of Christianity, namely that God became man in the form of the Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the absolute paradox because it defies reason's ability to comprehend it. Kierkegaard explains the paradox this way, that God became man, first of all. Second, that the eternal broke into time or took on human form in the figure of Jesus Christ. And that thereby, in the figure of Jesus Christ, the infinite became finite. In the idea, first of all, that God became man, we have the basic kernel of Christian faith of what is called the Incarnation. And Kierkegaard tries to describe this philosophically in point two, that eternity broke into time. And thirdly, as a throwback to Hegel, explaining the same character of the paradox, that the infinite became finite. Through faith, according to Kierkegaard, we participate in the absolute paradox. That is, we participate in the moment, the time of fulfillment, as the juncture, as the juncture where eternity impinges upon time. So through the leap of faith, we embrace the absolute paradox. But that leap of faith is transforming in the sense that through the absolute paradox, we are granted access to the fullness of this moment, or what in religious terms is called the time of fulfillment. As this central point in time where eternity manifest itself throughout each and every moment. As a little bit of theological background, let me briefly mention that when Kierkegaard refers to the moment and of, and of eternity impinging on the present, he is referencing this idea of the time of fulfillment or what in theological sense, borrowing from the Greeks, is called the eschaton, or the end time. The end time, however, is not simply a future that withdraws indefinitely and appears never to come. Rather, the end time designates a future, as we saw in the earlier quote, a future that is already impending, a future that already includes and embraces the past and the present, and thereby a future that in already taking shape is bringing along with it the experience of eternity. And thus eternity is not separate from the moment for Kierkegaard. On the contrary, eternity is already unfolding in the moment. Keeping this in mind, here we see the basic demarcation between what Kierkegaard calls the leap of faith 
which is our participation in this moment, in this transforming realization of eternity in the present. In contrast to simply a theoretical aspect of belief, where belief involves simply the affirming of doctrine or statements of authority or what might otherwise be called dogma. Thus, Kierkegaard makes a very famous statement in the concluding unscientific postscript. He says, no one starts by being a Christian. Rather, everyone becomes such in the fullness of time if he does become such. That is, in this pervading of eternity in the moment and in our participation in that moment in which eternity reveals itself, that is, through the leap of faith, then one is transformed. That is, a Christian begins. and thereby undertakes or experiences this dramatic conversion. And this conversion is really necessary to become a Christian ahead of any externals of belief, including the ritual and church going. None of all that, according to Kierkegaard, makes one a Christian. In this way, Kierkegaard combats, as Nietzsche will later do, the institutionalization of Christianity, or what Kierkegaard calls Christendom. With his genius knowledge of philosophy and religious background, Kierkegaard offers few insights into religion that few people have ever rivaled. And as a 19th century thinker, he stands out as one of the most brilliant interpreters of the Christian faith and of the Christian religion that we have ever seen. And I don't think there's much, pardon the levity, I don't think there's too much doubt about that. As I've indicated, Kierkegaard is one of the most brilliant interpreters of the Christian faith that we have ever seen. In this regard, Kierkegaard sought to distill Christianity down to its simplest element. What the Chris, well, sorry, what the Protestant theologian Rudolf Bultmann of the 20th century would later call the kerygma. That is the core message. For Kierkegaard, the core message of Christianity is revealed through the absolute paradox. That is, the incarnation of God and man through the figure of Jesus and all its implications is the core message, key truth, the kernel, if you will, of Christianity that transcends both doctrine and ritual. As I mentioned, Kierkegaard criticizes Christianity in an institutionalized form or what he calls Christendom. As such, Kierkegaard was one of the greatest advocates of Christianity, and yet at the same time, perhaps with the exception of Nietzsche, one of its greatest critics. And that's one of the intriguing aspects of Kierkegaard's thinking. His unusual and singular approach to Christianity inspired future theologians, not only Protestant theologians of the tradition like Rudolf Bultmann, by the way, who was also a contemporary and colleague of Martin Heidegger at Marburg in the 1920s, but also Kierkegaard inspired others, including theologians like Karl Barth, Paul Tillich, and many of the greatest of the 20th century all show a great depth to Kierkegaard's depth and range of insight. Let me briefly mention 
Kierkegaard's discussion of the stage as a life, which appears in his writings, either or. Kierkegaard maps out three stages of self-development or stages of life, which anticipates later developments of the same theme, uh, particularly in a psychoanalytic or psychological light uh, by theorists uh, like Maslow in the 20th century. Be that as it may, for Kierkegaard, these stages include the aesthetic individual, the ethical individual, and the religious individual. The aesthetic individual is defined by the pursuit of diversions and pleasure. He or she indulges in the frivolities of life and most of all, refuses to make a commitment. Thus, as we've seen for Kierkegaard, the aesthetic individual is immersed in despair. Second, we have the ethical individual, which is the reverse. He or she exercises choice and is prepared to make a commitment and renew that commitment over and over again, as, for example, in the case of marriage. In a way, for Kierkegaard, marriage is like an example of a prelude to a leap, a leap into uncertainty. Thus, the ethical individual confronts his uncertainty and is awakened by the anxiety of that uncertainty in order to overthrow the grip of despair. Finally, we come to the religious individual. The highest level of self-development is the religious individual, although this stage extends the commitment made by the ethical individual. The highest commitment of all, of course, is the commitment to God. That is the commitment made through the leap of faith and underscored and supported by the leap of faith. The religious individual overcomes the limitations and frustrations in seeking partial, finite forms of happiness, overcomes the self-fragmentation of pursuing frivolous pursuits. The religious individual thereby, in that transformative moment of conversion, overcomes all the vicissitudes and negativity of despair. As such, the religious individual lives in the renewed moment, in the time of fulfillment, of perpetual self-transformation. Although this is certainly a development of Christianity, this notion of the fulfillment of the moment, of transformation in the moment, is not finalized, however brilliantly, in Kierkegaard's writings of theology and philosophy, as we'll see in, the, in a forthcoming lecture. Nietzsche, who also criticizes Christianity, albeit seemingly a contrast to Kierkegaard, likewise emphasizes this transformative moment. And thus, as we'll discover, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, while seemingly contraries, both set the stage for the development of existentialism in the 20th century.